assalamu alaikum everybody welcome back this is uh, dr kiran hashmi once again from skillers education consultancy uh, we have with us uh, another student as i told you that i'm introducing my students these days to showcase their talents their potential and i don't think there's any other achievement for a teacher to have a tech student or his or her student showcasing their talent making people uh, let making people know what their potential is and you know just to just to tell that this is the kind of students we have in our lives so we have somebody who I'm really proud of i really wanted her to be on my uh, uh, my webinar i really wanted her to show me her talent her potential with us and she is um, arlene andrews i got a chance hi arlene hi i got a chance to meet her in one of the universities where she was pursuing her masters and uh, fortunately i was uh, a facilitator there i was uh, an assistant professor teaching them so from there i got to know darlene is a teacher she has been teaching for quite a number of years and mashallah say a brilliant teacher she is truly a brilliant teacher and i really want to uh, darlene to showcase her her attention and talents to you so uh, darlene please introduce yourself to everybody the ones who are here hi everybody uh, thank you for joining in my name is darlene andrews and uh, dr kiran thank you so much for your wonderful words of praise they really mean a lot um like you've mentioned before i have been teaching for about 10 years now uh, at one of the private schools in karachi uh, i have been through a series of grades i've taught one two four a uh, couple of times and then five a couple of times and i'm currently a grade 5 teacher um i teach mainly the core subjects which is uh, social studies and science and math and um language arts especially um i'm also doing my masters at zabist in education again and teaching is just my passion think is my passion as well and i am sure you must be knowing about it so uh, everybody just an announcement it is a very important topic that darlene has brought for you all today all those teachers who are listening to me please invite others as well because this is something that we always always encourage our teachers to go for and also the students it's a skill that we are going to talk about and the skill is of inquiry and that is what the title also is that we have today an inquiry to inquiry so everybody as always as i always encourage you to please feel free to write your comments in the chat box your queries your questions we will definitely be taking all of them at the end but there's anything that if you feel it's really important to share we will be giving the responses i again i will appreciate if you could invite more people to this session because this is something which is also the need of the time so uh, darling over to you all the very best let's share with what you have for all of us today Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen, and uh, I hope this is an enriching experience for everyone, because this, like uh, Dr. Kiran says, is a very, very important uh, topic, um, and it's just. Can everybody see my screen, Dr. Kiran? Is it visible? Yes, your screen is visible. We all can see it. Okay. If you want, if you if you want, I can put it up on a solo screen also. Uh, it's up to you. Whatever. I think I think it's it, it's fine this way. Let's do it in case if there's any problem, and if our audience will request, I will make it into a solo screen. All right. Okay. All right. All Great. the all the best. Thank you. Okay. So here we go. An inquiry to inquiry. Uh, inquiry is a constructivist pedagogy. and uh, dr kiran has already mentioned in uh, some of her previous uh, webinars about the importance of using constructivism as a 21st century skill um here in our schools today so let's begin with what is inquiry and then we're going to move on i'm going to take you through what inquiry is why it's needed where it can be used and how it can be used so let's start off with what it is inquiry is and educational strategy in which students follow methods and practices uh, similar to those of professional scientists in order to construct knowledge 
So it's a very scientific process that can be used in any subject area. It's not only related to science. But because it is a structured format that you kind of follow and develop one for yourself, it is a sort of a scientific strategy. It is also a process. It's a process of discovering new relationships. Uh, the learner formulates hypotheses. He tests them, or he researches, or he investigates, makes observations, brings to the table conclusions. Uh, and Finally, inquiry is an approach to problem solving, and it involves the application of several problem solving skills, which again we know is so crucial to 21st century learning. Where can inquiry be integrated besides science? Just because it follows a scientific uh, uh, procedure does not mean it can only be used in the field of science while you're teaching science in your classrooms. It can be used for research, for development projects, and teaching across the curriculum. I have used this method in social studies, in language arts, uh, in science, and I know of people who have used them in subjects like art as well. So we, I will explain these to you a little further. Uh, let's look at what an inquiry framework looks like. So because it has a structure, hence there is a framework. Online, you will find a number of frameworks. Some will have four steps, some will have five steps, some will have six steps. Now, the research that I, um, I've read through has consolidated or brought together all these different four and five and six and seven step uh, frameworks and combined it into a four step um, framework that has other steps interspersed into each uh, level. So we are calling this the first phase. Now, each of these steps is actually a phase. So the first phase is the orientation phase. Uh, from And after that, we go into conceptualization, investigation, and finally, conclusion. Now, if you come down to orientation, there is uh, it overlaps with discussion. So we need a lot of discussion during the orientation phase. In conceptualization, students question, and they generate hypotheses. And again, there is the need for discussion, communication, and reflection. This is a very reflective process. Every step you take, every phase you go through, everything you design, everything uh, a student wants to do, he has to or she has to question herself, uh, uh, think about what is needed, how, how it's working, if it's working or not, does the course need to be changed? What needs to be done at every step needs a strong reflection. When we come into the investigative phase, there is exploration, there is experimentation, there is data interpretation. Uh, this comes into research. A lot of research is done at this phase. If you are doing science, perhaps some experimentation is done at this phase. Uh, is the experiment working? Do we need to interpret what, what results are we getting? What data am I collecting? So you take all of that. And again, there's a reflective process. There is a communicative process. You have to work collaboratively on these uh, projects that you, that you design. And finally, when this cyclic process so the first three phases, orientation, conceptualization, and investigation form a cyclical process. Because with constant reflection, you may want to start changing things. Students may want to start changing something. And so they go to the stage before, and then they, they proceed in that uh, certain way. When you come into conclusion, you are ready to present your findings because you've come up with a theory or you have found the answer to your problem and you're absolutely sure about it. And there is some way that you have designed that you want to show your audience your finding. That is basically conclusion, as well as what is the next step? 
what is the future where do you take this now what do you do with it okay so we're going to go into each of these phases individually so you get a proper idea of um, exactly what each entails we begin with phase one orientation now this basic phase is to introduce your topic or your lesson uh, so for example i'll work one of my examples through this uh, um, through the whole framework so uh, in my um, classroom when i'm teaching social studies i use a lot of inquiry um, and i take it i look at it as a broader whole of the unit rather than uh, an individualized lesson so i know that the very beginning part of my unit is me giving students information or having them research for it but it is not necessarily through an inquiry based process towards the end when i know the kids are familiar they have some prior knowledge now uh, they bring a lot to the table they have a depth a certain depth of understanding and an independence in which to work i now take them forward to the inquiry phase and this is usually towards my final project with the kids um so for example in our unit on cities um my initial uh, in the initial uh, part of the unit i am sort of teaching them i'm bringing them from ancient cities and bringing them to modern cities their project is going to be based on a modern city so whatever i'm teaching them my input me as a teacher now not as a facilitator in an inquiry process i'm going through ancient times and ancient cities and the development of the cities and how those cities have finally come to become our modern day cities so for example in my classroom at this point in time where we're at the the cusp of making or beginning our final project i will have the kids sit down at their seats and either independently or cumulatively as a group or a pair come up with about five or six questions perhaps um or sort of just bring back all their knowledge not even questioning at this phase just bring back their knowledge talk about something i'll give them some food for thought now this food from thought comes from my engagement tools and if you look at this table here uh, there's a number of engagement tools i could use now i could put up a picture of perhaps new york city i could put up uh, a video of karachi it could be anything that gets students thinking looking observing getting to what i'm bringing them to so uh, you can use videos images photos open ended questions problems discussions or a uh, communication at all points here there is a discussion and there is a communication um the whole idea is to make real world connections to their experiences to activate prior knowledge and to hook their interest right from the get go then we move in to the second phase so the second phase is the conceptualization phase now that i've shown them a picture perhaps of new york city uh, i'm going to ask them either independently in pairs or in small groups to come together and formulate five open ended questions about cities in general i'm not specifying anything at the moment this is very open still it's a very broad discussion so this is more like i use a think pair share sort of uh, technique where they think about it where they can uh, pair and they can talk before they start sharing the questions they've come up with with their classroom at this point it i must and i cannot stress enough the need for students to previously understand and have the knowledge of open ended questions open ended questions as we all know are questions that require not a yes or no answer those are closed questions they do not uh, have just one simple fact as an answer they take a little more research their answers are more developed more 
looked out for, more experimented. More, you know, you have to read through a lot to finally put something together. Um, so those are the type of questions you need to practice beforehand uh, with your students. So also, it's good for teachers to be um, asking those open-ended questions of their students. So you sort of are a role model for them. So um, some engagement tools at this point, uh, you could use the Think Fair Share, you could use KWL charts, you could use just brainstorming, like clouds of wonder, things like that. Uh, and of course, when you come to the pairing and the sharing, there is a discussion and there is communication again. Now, um, what I'm going to do next is for my kids, I have them come together at the share part. They give me their questions. Um, they take turns in giving me questions and I write them out on the board or someone from the classroom comes and writes them up on the board. Now, because I, I, I have certain standards, I need to meet certain criteria for me to, for the students to meet by the end of that, uh, by the end of our unit, I've got those in mind. And so once all the questions are out on the board, I begin to categorize them with students. Perhaps two or more questions can fall under one standard. Perhaps another one looks like another standard. That way, if you channel, rephrase, uh, sort of shape and mold the student questions, it still seems that they've done all the work. You are just facilitating and being that extra guide to them. Um, now, once we as a class have come up with five basic questions, open-ended, that seem about meeting the standards that I have in mind for this unit. Um, the kids have a go ahead to take those, to think about a city that uh, they want to research about, perhaps uh, group up if they're doing the same kind of cities, do a lot of research, come up with some answers, bring the answers together, talk about it, discuss about it. Um, another part of this phase is to hypothesize. So perhaps students come up with an answer to the questions, a maybe answer, just like we do in the scientific method, is you have, you're going to do this today. What's your hypothesis? Once they have this prediction in place, uh, they can begin to further research. This is their starting point for their research. Uh, students are wondering about the questions. I wonder if this is the case. Is this going to happen? Am I going to find this here? Um, and then we move on from there. Phase three is investigation. This is the actual um, exploration, experimentation, and data interpretation. So this is where students are full into looking, planning, designing. What are we going to do? Here are our questions. How are we going to find out the answers to these or find out the information about this city based on these questions? Um, what are we going to do? So they come up, they frame a plan. They design their problem solving approach, if that is what you're doing with them. They identify their resources. So for me, uh, kids know I prefer for them to have at least three resources, a primary resource, um, something like an article, a newspaper. Um, you know, people have traveled around, so they, that could be their primary resources. Uh, they could use encyclopedias. They could use books that they can borrow from the library to help them through this process. So any help that I can give them in terms of going and getting them a couple of books or when they go to library checkout, that's when they can get those books. It's all up to them. They have to let me know what they would like me to do. And of course, I'm always available. I'm always walking the room to hear in on conversations. And if I find that they are not in the right direction or wherever it doesn't seem right, I step in, I ask them a few questions to redirect their thinking. I do not impose my thinking on them. Because at the end of the day, this is their inquiry process. They, they are inquiring. 
they need to find the answers. Uh, in the experimentation phase, this is like the actual research part. Of it. They've got their resources. Now they just need to uh, get their head into the game. And they've got to study, learn, understand, try to figure out from multiple sources the answers to these questions. In the event that it is a science experiment, they've actually got to perform the experiment itself. And while they're doing this, they're observing, they're gathering data. If it's a math problem, perhaps they're making a chart. Um, they are uh, collaborating. There's a lot of reflection at this point in time. Are my answers correct? Is this the right track I'm on? Um, what can I do to improve this? Finally, we come into the data interpretation phase. So once they've gathered all their information, um, just like researchers, just like uh, investigators or experimenters, you come up with a whole lot of data. Now it's time to sort and organize the data, look for the exact specific answers, combine them, put them together, form the best sort of answer response that you possibly can. Uh, a lot of them at this point are identifying patterns, especially in terms of math, in terms of uh, science. They're looking for patterns. They're looking for inferences. Um, what does all of this mean? They are trying to find meaning in the data that they've collected. And at the same time, they're thinking, how am I going to now present this data? What sort of information am I looking at that I have found? How am I going to present this to my class? How am I going to share my knowledge? A uh, couple of ways of sharing could be through artwork or projects, uh, which could be trifold boards. You could do uh, 3D projects. Um, my uh, project on cities was a lot of them chose trifold boards. Some of them chose 3D models and trifold boards. Uh, some of them chose PowerPoint presentations. They have the freedom to choose how they want to present their information. Let's always leave that as an open choice to students. Uh, because at the end of the day, they are still doing they are meeting the criteria. They're meeting the standards. So how they present it, as long as you have some sort of guidelines about uh, how you're scoring presentations, I don't see the harm in them choosing what way they present it. I think it just brings out more innovation and creativity in their work. And there's real ownership in that. Finally. We come to the conclusion. Now, it's been a long process. You have to give this entire process time. This is not going to happen perhaps in one sitting. So when I'm doing my final uh, uh, presentation, my final project, I keep at least two weeks for this because I know the time is going to take for them to get through the inquiry process and to have a good quality result at the end of it. Um, so in this uh, portion, the students refine their theories. If they come up with a theory, if their hypotheses worked, um, you know, they could uh, do other things. They could come up with different ways of questioning uh, further. OK, what if I do this? If they're changing their, um, um, their sorry, their, in science, when you change your, uh, um, your variance, so maybe something is uh, your variables when you change them. Perhaps they want to change them at this point and see what happens. Maybe we come up with more theories. Maybe they've solidified the one that they initially came up with. Uh, there's, again, a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion. There's further research. There's planning, designing. And then when this is all done and they construct their presentation, they're finally ready to share what they've learned with the rest of the class, with you. Perhaps uh, I love to put up a show. So I'll call my students. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call other students from other classes. I'll invite. We'll send out invitations. We'll have um, parents come in so that students are proud of what they've done. And they get an opportunity to celebrate their learning by showing it off. Uh, I think there's nothing more that excites students than having their parents come watch them. Uh, and be proud of what they've done. I think that that's just a wonderful thing. Uh, at least once have a showcase of just what they've done in class. Um, 
but along with this they also need to have their reasons for why um to justify what they found they need their evidence and they need to answer questions that come along the way as well and at the end of this process there's a reflection what have we done um where did we go what did we find is there something different we would have done can some other part of research come out of this can we take this in any other direction uh they can debate perhaps there's someone else in the room who has a contradiction why not uh the more there is uh that argue and compare and contrast the more the opportunity is open for students to learn to open up their thinking this is what this process does is it widens horizon it deepens understanding it it helps them just be better thinkers and this is also a point if you use the kwl chart this is where they fill out the l portion of the kwl chart the learned portion okay now besides having uh, phases of the framework there are different levels of inquiry this is different um different extents to which inquiry pro progresses so the first stage is the uh, confirmation inquiry this is where you are basically a teacher is the model the teacher models their inquiry for the students to pick up on so there's a high level of teacher involvement and this also reinforces prior knowledge this you finally move then into structured inquiry in which there you set the process and the students simply follow it knowing that this is what we have to go through following that is guided inquiry now our teacher involvement the levels are dropping at this point your three you're giving them about a quarter worth of the help that you were uh, giving them in perhaps the first stage um this is where you provide the research questions and students design the process and they go through their process and they they create the construct and they go through every phase of their process the last the final a uh, level of inquiry is the open or true inquiry which is where you basically want the students to eventually end up is be able to do open or true inquiry uh from setting questions a student basically in this part in this level will go through the entire inquiry process all by themselves as a group as a collaborative group or even as an independent level however group is a is better because there's a lot of collaboration and communication going on there's more minds working at the same thing so those are the levels of inquiry now i have let's talk about uh, the role of the teacher in an inquiry based learning so as you progress through the levels your involvement with the process and how the process is uh, being carried out by students decreases because students have gained independence so student independence has increased teacher involvement decreases um your role as at a true um inqu uh, inquiry uh, level would be to model the inquiry based thinking processes for students uh, you can be a co learner because you know what it's okay to say i don't know let's find out together or perhaps let's see if this works b take part in their learning as well be a share for them be on the lookout for teachable moments arising from problems of understanding so if one group comes up with a problem that you think is going to benefit all the learners in that classroom be up front and out loud about it let it be out there put it out there let everyone solve it together let solutions come from students themselves a teacher poses questions what you want to ask them what you want to tell them frame it as a question what input can you get from them and then ask again ask in a different way ask to be specific about what you want from them provide opportunities for students to express what they know in multiple ways again uh, like i said you can have the same criteria but different projects different styles of projects and that's perfectly fine 
guide students to a variety of different resources and experiences that will assist them in the investigation of their questions. You could use books, expert sources, field experiences, whatever it takes. Be there to give though, give it to them, you know, help them. Hey, you know what? The library is there. You have a little time. Why don't you go over to the library and perhaps set up a time prior to that uh, with the librarian? Uh, you have to be organized and you have to have done your part before you can actually get into uh, uh, this with the kids. Then you document and reflect on student question and ideas because you sometimes may not know everything that the students are asking and you yourself may need to find out. So stay on top of your game and it's okay uh, to say, I don't know, let's find out together. Facilitate frequent knowledge building discourse. So you want to be at the forefront of knowledge building. Don't just give them, don't fill them. This is not the banking system of education. Don't make it that. Let them figure it out. Help them build one brick at a time. Establish a culture of psychological safety. So if a student has something they want to share and something, nothing is wrong. There is no wrong answer. There is no wrong answer. You have to guide them into saying, OK, perhaps, maybe not this way. Try another way. Um, you know and focus on broad key concepts rather than specific expectations. You prompt students into design mode. You encourage them to suggest how to investigate their ideas. So planning, planning stage is very important here. Um, it's part of the um, one of the stages, uh, the third stage of the inquiry framework. Plan in a flexible and responsive way. Remember, this always has the potential to change. If it needs to change, the kids can think about why it needs to be changed and what change is needed to make it better. That's the reflective part of the process that can be done at every little step that students take. Just so that by the end of it all, they have something that they've, they've reflected upon throughout the process. They know that this, yes, this is our conclusion and this makes sense now. So those are some of the steps some of the, the way teachers are involved in inquiry-based learning. Um, so I'm going to share now a video about uh, inquiry and action in a classroom. And you're going to see how this teacher works from um, works towards open inquiry, from a confirmation um, inquiry all the way to open inquiry. There, all the, the level that she takes through her one lesson, through a single lesson. So please do watch and enjoy. Inquiry-based learning can take on many different forms, from highly structured play to students spontaneously asking questions and figuring out how to test them. Inquiry is not a free-for-all where students are expected, for example, to spontaneously rediscover Newton's laws of motions by themselves. Newton made use of thousands of years of combined knowledge to make his discoveries. Students can't be expected to make bold conclusions in a vacuum of knowledge. That's why Andrea decides to start her lessons by laying down a foundation of basic content. Simple machines, what simple machines do is they move objects. They help us move objects. I'm going to write that on. In other words, Andrea is going to teach, with teaching content being something that she's comfortable with and knows she's good at. Here, Andrea is teaching about simple machines with an emphasis on inclined planes. One thing Andrea keeps in mind is that the overall expectation in the science curriculum is to link the content to society and the environment. One of these simple machines. All right. Excellent. Andrea makes some of these links by showing off a variety of simple machines in our everyday lives, something that she learned about in her online searches. Using a lever, you just didn't know it. A wheel and axle, that's right. So here's my axle, here's my wheel. She's also teaching the students about how simple machines make our lives easier. Heavy things like that. Once Andrea has gone over some fundamental concepts, she and her class are now ready to move on to some basic structured inquiry. With structured inquiry, Andrew will provide her students with a question to answer or a problem to solve and give her students a procedure to follow in order to arrive at a solution. She will not, however, provide the students with the solution. That's up to them to figure out. This is what you're going to do. You're going to take one book and you're going to put your inclined plane on the book and inside you will find a styrofoam ball. You're going to take your styrofoam ball 
you're going to put it at the top of your incline plane and you're going to let it roll down and wherever it stops you're going to let it stop you're going to measure from the end of the incline plane to the middle of the ball and you're going to write it down so for one book you're going to roll the ball and write down how many centimeters it went do that two more times then what you're going to do is you're going to do it for how many books do you think now two, two. so you're going to add another textbook and do it again three times and then you're going to do it again how many textbooks this time three you guys are too smart and make sure that someone in the group is recording all the measurements so someone can help it roll someone can measure it and someone can be writing that way everyone in the group has a here not only do we see andrea using structured inquiry to help the students become familiar with the material but structured inquiry also helps them go over the content that they have just learned notice how andrea has separated the class into groups of six typically groups of three are ideal it means everyone gets a chance to make use of the materials and perform some experimenting or problem solving. Now that the students have a good knowledge and experience foundation and have had a chance to become familiar with the materials, Andrea can start to push the limits of what her class can achieve. Does everyone see that? So when you increase the steepness... It's at this point that Andrea will challenge her students with a guided inquiry activity. With guided inquiry, Andrea will pose a question to her class and present them with a problem to solve. Using what they have learned up until this point, it will be up to the students to figure out a procedure to follow and ultimately arrive at the solution. The guided inquiry presents the perfect opportunity to spark students' imaginations by allowing Andrea to present creative scenarios for students to take part in. By looking at curriculum expectations, Andrea can come up with scenario ideas that link the content to society and the environment. There's any way I can move this and get Barry to the top of the bench? There is a simple machine that we could use to help Barry. What do you think? A ramp. A ramp. And what's the word again for ramps that we're going to be using? Excellent. But you have to build an inclined plane to get Barry to the top of the mountain. We have lots of inclined planes, so what could we do with all these inclined planes? And I have masking tape in here as well. What could we do? Uh, we can just tape them up. Absolutely. You have to get Barry to the top of the hill. You move Barry by moving the mask. Guided inquiry can be incredibly rewarding for a class. Teachers will often hear their students cheer when they arrive at a working solution to a challenging problem. Guided inquiry also achieves a strong balance between student freedom and constraints. Students are instructed to solve a specific problem with specific tools, but are given the freedom to arrive at the solution using their own strategies. The end result is that students take ownership of their work and arrive at the lesson's desired conclusions without being overwhelmed by too many options and going too far off the beaten track. It takes practice to create a guided inquiry activity that really hooks students. If an activity is compelling enough, it's often at this stage that Andrea will encounter students who won't want to stop playing and building. Their motivation can be quite high. You were able to get Barry to the top of the mountain. That's every single group. Everyone, big round of applause. Good job. You all got Barry to the top. Very good. So you have to get the medicine to him. Now here's the problem. Here, Andrea is presenting a second activity that she has previously observed to be quite appealing to students. You have to build a transport system to move the It's also often during guided inquiry that students will start asking questions, trying to delve deeper into the content. These questions are the key to the next step in inquiry, open inquiry. Open inquiry is a byproduct of other forms of inquiry. With open inquiry, the teacher does not provide the solution, the method, nor the question. The students come up with the questions. Because Andrea has scaffolded the inquiry, students should feel comfortable enough now with the materials to answer many of the inquiry questions that they or their colleagues might have. Doing so would involve making predictions and planning their own procedure with some teacher assistance. Here, Andrea encourages the students to come up with questions about inclined planes that can be answered through experimentation. She and the class are going to figure out which questions can be tested using the available materials. Ultimately, because the questions come from the student's curiosity, there is a high intrinsic motivation to arrive at a conclusion. Open inquiry leads to powerful teachable moments and is incredibly satisfying for students and teachers who both use the opportunity to learn something new. Check out the next video in this inquiry series to learn all about the teacher's skills needed to succeed. Okay, and I hope you enjoyed that video. And not only did it also show you how the teacher moved from 
through the, the different levels of inquiry, but it also gives you an example, a working example of how she used it in her classroom. And that's, that'll help give you an idea of how to uh, implement it in yours. Now, 10 reasons why we use inquiry-based learning. I mean, 10 is, 10 is the minimum we can see here, but there's a lot more. So it nurtures student passion and talents. Um, it empowers students. It gives them a voice and their choices are honored. This is not just, hey, you listen to me. What I say is right. You are wrong. It doesn't work that way. Here, we have to treat them as individuals who have a voice, who have an opinion, they have a choice, and we give them that respect. It increases motivation and engagement. It fosters curiosity and a love for learning. And I think that's one of the prime things needed in um, schools today is for students to have the curiosity and to build on it, to share it, and to develop a love for learning through that. It teaches grit, perseverance. They don't learn to fail and leave it alone. Uh, they've got a growth mindset and they self-regulate. It's building their um, the skills that they need in, in 21st century. It makes research meaningful and develops strong research skills. It deepens the understanding to go beyond memorizing facts and content. They now apply this to real life situations. They fortify the importance of asking good questions. They, it enables students to take ownership over their own learning and to reach their goals. And number 10, it solves the problems of tomorrow in the classrooms of today. So it brings society to school. It brings real life problems into school. And that's why we teach students to make them workable citizens to go out there and become part of society. And that's all that I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I hope you have learned. I hope it's helped you to um, learn more about inquiry. Thank you, um, Darlene. I think it was a very, very interactive, very good session and specifically the video. There are certain comments which the audience have shared and I would like now to respond. And audience, uh, if you would still like to question anything, please feel free to write in the chat box. We will now be taking all your queries and responses. So the first question that came in, I mean, it was more of a, a comment, yet a question came in from Tristan. It's appearing on your screen. Uh, is, it, is this applicable in the class of 35 when the syllabus is predefined and teachers are restricted to 40 to 45 minutes? Timeline and not allowed to deviate from the lesson. Yeah, you can uh, incorporate it into, remember, like we said, um, put them into groups. 35 students could easily mean you've got seven groups um, uh, of five students each. Um, that works fine. Use the model that I use in my class. I have them all sit down. There's a think session where they come up with the five questions uh, about the certain topic that you want to teach them about. OK, and then guide them and let them share their questions. They should be open ended questions. They cannot be closed ended questions. They have to be open ended. Put them on the board as quickly as you can and let uh, maybe uh, turn them into sort of, you know, like tweak them so that they're matching your standards and your criteria of what you want to teach that day, your outcome, and then have them research about it. Now, if you don't have time in your class to do the research part, have them research at home. You know, they have the questions, have them bring in that information, and then they can move on to the next level of inquiry, which is where they are the next phase in which they sort out that information, they interpret that data, and then they can form their presentations in the classroom or even like home base. I understand time constraints. Right. So thank you. I think the answer is well explained. There's another question today. Are there any predominant, predetermined SLOs for such a lesson? Um, you basically have to go with the end in mind. Okay, it's not a pre-falling lesson. Remember that it still got some structure. And just because you are a facilitator does not mean that this lesson is going to go into any direction that it wants to take. You are going to allow students to guide you, allow you to drive, allow them to drive the um, uh, the lesson. But at the end, the outcome that you have in mind has to be sort of fulfilled. And that's why I streamline those questions for them to match my criteria and my standards. 
Right. right. So there are two very interesting comments from uh, Aisha. A lot of talking discussion questions um, lead to the sort of learning in deep while you were explaining your stage number four. And then another comment that appeared is about KWL when you spoke about KWL. So she's actually validating the response that yes, it actually helps in understanding yeah. the concept better and so you know I have think it's a great assessment tool. KWL charts are really good for assessment tools because they tell you exactly where the kids were, where they wanted to go, and where you've taken them or where they've gone. And it's a great thing to put portfolios and show parents and put in notebooks because it really shows growth. True. Uh, there's another question uh, which I would like you to answer, darling. How do we determine individual learning in yeah. such group? Um, you know your students and you're going to be listening in on conversation. Although this is a collaborative project, if you've ever had kids work on collaborative projects, they themselves will be able to best tell you, hey, this so-and-so person is not doing what they need to do. OK, so listen to conversations. See where um, students are currently and how they are learning. You have to be vigilant. You have to be there. You're not just sitting at your seat. You are involved in the process. As a silent member, you're in there when they need that direction. So you will definitely understand which learner needs what and will learn how much. And plus, the presentation at the end really shows. Hmm. All right. Yeah. I don't have any other questions still. We have about five minutes. So if any viewer would like to still ask or share any comment, please feel free. By the time, Diane, I have a question for you uh, while I think I'm just utilizing the time. Uh, if you would like to take it, like, for example, your, your uh, experience is mainly from the school background. And yes, we encourage a lot of inquiry from the early years. But what if we would like to take inquiry to a higher education setup? What do you suggest? How could we take it up to a slightly higher level? Um, so there are a lot of interesting videos on YouTube that I've been watching that actually, and I have no high school uh, teaching experience, right? But I do understand that it is very easy to actually use over there because students are independent more or less at that stage in time. And you can take your, your final project um, through the inquiry framework, you use the same framework. You, you students just their level of questioning is higher, open ended questions. Um, and I think their level of research is higher. Everything, your expectations of the students are also higher. So I think it's very um, transferable, it can be used anywhere. Right, thank right. you. So another comment from Aisha, contribution to shows and also when you interact with groups, that's how you know about learning. So Aisha, exactly, that's how we work. And that is the reason why socialization in education is very important. The yes. more we socialize, the more we work together, the more we contribute in each other's learning. Your learning also enhances and so the kind of word that we generally use, holistic education, that actually takes its real shape when we work with each other in harmony. Uh, another question, Dali. Is IBL more suited for subjects with a science? Every subject. You can use it in literature. You can yeah. definitely yeah. use it in literature. Again, uh, I encourage you now. I myself um, have not, I, I try and use it as often as I can. Uh, but I am no expert. I'm learning all the time. And I keep researching. I keep watching a lot of videos. So I think that's something everyone out there should do. If you really want to implement this in your literature lesson, there is guidance out there um, that you can get. You can read up on it, research on it. And you know, you know, even hit back with employees, you know, colleagues, uh, share, collaborate you will definitely come up with how to do it and how to integrate it. OK, I would like to add to what Darlene has just said. So Ms. Sadia, you can integrate it. See, inquiry is a skill. We need to learn the skill as teachers, and we need to communicate the same skills with our students. So if we are able to communicate that, and if you're successful, it can be done in any subject, irrespective at any level. Right? Yeah. Because inquiry actually helps us to go deeper into the content that we are trying to learn and make meanings on our own. 
trying to develop the interpretation of the concept that is around us in our own world. So it is open to any subject, any content, any concept at all, right? So it's not restricted to this. So any other or uh, we have almost come to the end of this session today. Uh, I hope, Darlene, you had a good time. I did. And it flew by so fast. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> Right, I told you that you're going to shock your own self and you'll be proud of yourself after conducting it. So Thank I'm really, so really anticipating to have you another time with something else to talk about. This is a forum to learn. And as I announced in the, in the beginning also, when I've been announcing it every session that I conduct, I am actually showcasing the potential of my students. This platform is for all those who would like to come forward, who would like to share their skills, who would like to share the intellectual capacities they have. And I'm so proud of the students I have been up. I'm really, really fortunate. So just one more question, um, Dali, and then we will end uh, the webinar. Sure. Yes, it's actually for me. It's more about an absolutely inquiry is a higher order thinking skill. If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy, which is generally the most, most of the teachers are only familiar with Bloom's, but it's not only one. There are many other. So inquiry falls in the sixth level because then you are actually giving an opportunity to students to create, to construct, and also to go deeper into the content on their own. So inquiry is research. And when you go into the stage of research, you are actually into a higher order thinking skill automatically. All right. So with this, uh, there's one thing that I would like you to see. <laughs> <laughs> She's my sister. <laughs> okay. So I think I would like invite uh, Chrislyn. I would like to invite Chrislyn for some of the some of the sessions if she's great. She is great. Right? Okay. So thank you very much, Darlene, and thank you very much all the audiences who have joined me today. As always, Saturdays and Sundays, I am trying to showcase something that is different, something that is new, and something which is contextual, relevant, and needed at least for this time, and not only for this time for years to come. So next week, I will be coming up with two more very, very interesting topics. I'm announcing them now. Uh, Saturday, we will be having a session on STEM education. And Sunday, we will be having a session on teaching through technology games. Right? So I will now be introducing those two topics to all of you. So stay tuned the way you've always been. Thank you very much. Great session. Girls, Thank well you. done. Oh, Chris, she's calling me a girl. I <laughs> shall. Thank you. Yeah, Hello. Right? <laughs> we, okay. So we are signing off now. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. I will now meet you next Saturday. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. And yes, as I always say, stay happy, stay positive, and please spread positivity around. Bye, everyone. Okay.